Ah, OK. Hello, everyone. So um, this is my art of debugging. Um, this is my take on debugging, uh, the workflow that I find useful. And um, hopefully, uh, this, there'll be some tricks in here that will help you as well. The talk is broken into two sections. The first section is more about kind of the approach to debugging that I'll use. And the second half will be um, practical uh, live coding. Um, so you know we'll have to pray to the gods that that will work. Um, but the real trick is to uh, well the real trick to debugging is um, don't write bugs. Um, so yeah. Um, any questions? We've got about 50 minutes. So no. Okay. Um, Assuming you're not robots um, and you've written a bug or two, um, I've lied about the don't write bugs. And in fact, actually, I believe that writing lots of bugs can lead to lots of experience, um, and it makes you a better developer. Um, and you need that experience to know how to approach uh, debugging in the first place and how to recognize bugs. Um, so spend your time on bugs, using them as a challenge for your work, rather than seeing them as a, a problem, as something you have to uh, get past before you get to the interesting part. Um, so there's no hard and fast skill to learning uh, how to debug and how to crack every single bug, um, but it is literally something that takes time and repeating the process over and over again, hours and hours of work, till you can recognize a bug instantly, do all the debugging in your head, and, and jump straight to the solution. Um, the upshot is, if you meet the bug the second time round, hopefully it doesn't take you that long. So the company I worked at uh, almost a decade ago, when new people join the company, they'd be all excited about joining, and we, you know, we upsold what they would be working on and the features and so on. Um, but when they sat down, we would tell them that they would be working on uh, bug fixing for three months. And they'd normally leave a little bit deflated at that point. But actually, that three months of just bug fixing meant that they get to touch uh, a full range of different, uh, different code bases. So they'd work with different teams, um, touch the front end, the back end, some of the CSS, the JavaScript, you know, the whole range of uh, software that we were working on. Whereas someone working on a feature would be doing the same code for six months and probably only getting credit at the end, assuming it was delivered on time. And the bug fixer may have even come in at the last moment and rescued the project and got a bit of the, the fanfare. So those people who were working on the bugs for three months um, actually really enjoyed it and didn't want to leave uh, the bug fixing tasks. And you can become a master of, uh, of debugging as well. I used to work with a, um, a designer, front end developer, who long before I kind of understood how CSS really hung together, he could look at my CSS and tell me that this thing wasn't rendering properly because I needed um, zoom colon one. So the zoom, the zoom trick would fix a lot, of, uh, a lot of visual bugs in older versions of IE. But the only reason he knew this was by repeatedly coming up against problems, debugging them, and understanding what the solution was. Even though it took him moments to give me the answer, it's through his experience that he actually got to the point where he could identify that, debug it really quickly, and tell me almost with certainty what the answer was, had the way to fix the particular bug. And of course, debugging should be the last, um, last resort. I've got a friend here who tweeted this just recently, um, Brian LaRue, and he said um, a shocking admi uh, admission, he doesn't use debugger. And the reason for that is that he writes a lot of tests in the first place. So if you're writing tests and developing against those tests in the first place, you're, you're saving yourself the actual bug hunting time. But we still do have to do some debugging at some point. I have a couple of disclaimers, though. Um, frameworks. Um, I'm not a huge frameworks person. And by frameworks, I mean you know, Angular, Ember, React. Um, I like vanilla JavaScript a lot. Um, and there's also many, many different ways of uh, debugging and solving problems, and there's lots of tools out there. Um, and it's things like this where I'm transpiling code from JavaScript to JavaScript again, and my stack trace is just you know bundle, bundle, line, you know 35,000. Um, I find this frustrating to look at because I can't get to the source of the problem. Obviously, source maps will help with this problem, um, but they don't always work in my experience. 
Um, but I tend to attract bugs at the same time. So um, yeah. Now, equally, frameworks like uh, Angular and uh, React and Ember, I believe, as well, have built their own debugging tools for the debuggers. And thankfully, both Firefox and um, Chrome have an open API for their debugging tools, so you can extend on top of those. Um, and the React debugger is just one of those tools. Again, there's uh, Angular and uh, Ember I know of. I'm pretty sure Polymer has the same kind of things. And you can also build your own uh, debugging tools inside of the dev tools. My second disclaimer is a um, bit of a racy one. I rarely cross-browse a test. Um, and I know this sounds bad, but um, I write a lot of JavaScript. And as long as my JavaScript isn't touching the DOM, the JavaScript, if it doesn't work, it's not going to work in any browser, regardless of which version or what operating system it is. If it's just functional JavaScript, if it breaks, it breaks, no matter which browser. So there's really two types of JavaScript, in my opinion. There's um, the JavaScript that interacts with the browser and everything else. And it's that everything else that I spend a lot of my time working on. So that doesn't need, particularly need cross-browser testing. Anything that touches the DOM will do. But I can solve some of these problems ahead of time for myself using um, APIs, uh, polyfills for APIs, um, and uh, polyfills for kind of ES6, where I might do uh, string.includes or starts with and so on. Um, I write a lot of pure JavaScript. So JavaScript that isn't kind of interacting or expecting the DOM to be in a particular, uh, have particular support. Um, and then when it comes to rendering, that is actually where I'm doing some cross-browser testing, because it may not render the way I want it to, or there may be a rendering bug in an old version of Safari, for instance. So you know, there are tools to do browser testing, but I'm focusing on just one browser and just JavaScript at this point. And again, this is due to the nature of my particular work. And this doesn't mean, yeah, I don't cross-browser test. Have a look at Karma. Have a look at Zool. Um, I've started looking at Jest as well to give me uh, some help in this. But um, this will focus on uh, the art of debugging. And uh, Wikipedia has a page on debugging. And down here in tiny words, it does say it's an art. So um, we can call it an art. So the first part. Of, uh, of my art of debugging is to replicate. And this is the hardest part of the job. It, taking um, a bug that someone says, uh, this thing isn't saving for me. You can't go back and say it works for me. Okay? I, I've been guilty of it over the years. Um, and I'm sure any other developer has done the same thing. Yeah, it works for me. It works on my machine. It works in you know, in my location on my particular version of, uh, of Chrome or Safari or whatever browser I'm using, um, that's not good enough at all. Um, we need to replicate as closely as possible what they're actually seeing. Now, that, that doesn't mean all the way down to the machine and the operating system. I always start with a litmus test. If, something, if someone says, this thing doesn't save for me, the first thing I'm going to try is just, does it save? Or if this thing doesn't load for me, I try to load it. But typically, it does work. Um, and from there, um, I need to start kind of systematically working through how to replicate this particular bug. And one of those things will be I will ask for a screenshot of the, uh, of the user's browser. Um, some of the time, it can be plugins that are affecting the, uh, uh, the browser. So I'll ask them to open up uh, kind of an incognito mode and replicate the bug if they can. Um, and if they're still able to replicate the bug, it tends to mean there's some bug in the code. If they're not, it means there's something to do with the browser itself. There's some external aspect to the browser, like a plugin, for instance. So using incognito mode or privacy mode or some kind of mode that's very clean gives me um, like a, an insight as to whether or not it might be an external factor. Um, and for myself, I have, when I'm debugging, I have multiple profiles. So I have my, my normal, uh, so because I use Chrome, I'm signed in as myself, Remy, which means I go to Gmail, I'm signed in. I don't have to keep signing into these different tools. Um, but when I want to debug, I can switch to a different user that has a very clean, clean view. It hasn't got um, cookies already configured. It may not have uh, an, uh, service workers installed or app cache or anything like that. 
Um, and actually, I have a third user, which is my troll user, which has security kind of at the max. It disables cookies. Um, and you get some bugs will, will occur because cookies are disabled. For instance, local storage will throw an exception if cookies are disabled. So this is the big part of the work, replicating the actual bug in the first place. And the next step is to isolate the bug, pare it down into its smallest form. Um, I built a tool called JSBin, which was exactly for this task. I had uh, my colleagues I was working with were describing problems to me in written English, telling me that their JavaScript didn't work. Um, and I would basically ask them to try and put that into JSBin. And in doing so, it meant that they, they would remove a lot of their, the code that kind of was, had some different purpose. Um, so they were paring the problem down. And from there, I could try to isolate where the, uh, where the bug was occurring. There's different approaches to this. This is um, probably my, this is where I tend to end up if everything goes really badly, 50-50 testing. Um, I've used this to work out why old versions of Netscape, like 1999 versions of Netscape wasn't rendering pages, all the way to most recently um, using a, a git bisect, for instance. So this is where you take all of your code, and you know the bug somewhere in there, you cut it in half, and you test that half. And if that half doesn't have the bug, you know the bug's in the other half. Uh, it's it's a, a long process. But like I said, git bisect is exactly the same thing. Um, and the job is to kind of constantly reduce the code down into its smallest form. And once I've got that smallest form of the, the, the bug, I can actually put that into a test. And instead of having to go back and forth between this kind of replicating the, the, uh, the bug and this isolated version, I can actually code that into a test, and I can code against the test. I can fix the, the bug against that test. I know that it will never occur again because I have this test to prove that it doesn't work, uh, that it's closed. And then eliminating the bug, finally fixing it. This is literally the easy, easiest step of the entire process. Once I'm able to replicate a bug consistently, and I know where it is, fixing a bug could be anything from like a, a missing comma to a, miss, a typo in a function name to some piece of data not being in the state that I expect it to. So it's actually, for me, the, the simplest part. So. My art of debugging, replicate methodically, uh, isolate the bug carefully, and eliminate it uh, easily and entirely. Um, and then you have bugs that you cannot replicate. Now, if you can't replicate the bug at all, you are kind of out of luck. And you can blind code the solution, but you won't ever truly know if it's fixed. And then you have um, a Heisenbug. And uh, I like this because it's just cool to say, and I get to put Breaking Bad in the middle of my uh, slides. But a Heisenbug is, uh, I haven't made this up. This is you know, a real thing. Um, Heisenbug is a bug that will change, um, change shape, change its properties when you're trying to debug it. And I've had this in the past. I've had this in the past and in the present. Um, if you've used Firebug in your time, if you had Firebug open, that would actually introduce new DOM nodes into the, the page, and it would be running JavaScript inside of your page and changing some variables. If your code happened to use the same code or the same variable name that Firebug was using, you would not be able to fully uh, debug your bug because Firebug was messing with your code. Um, I have the same thing with Travis, for, for instance. So Travis, uh, continuous testing, um, I would fix my bug offline. I would submit it to uh, Travis. Travis would run all the automate tests, and it would fail, because Travis is running it in a different environment, which would trigger some kind of failure. Um, and the same is a little bit true today. If you're doing any performance testing uh, and any kind of recording of timelines in DevTools, the amount you have open can affect um, the performance of the page that you're recording. So if you have like a high performance, maybe a, a game or an animation, or you're testing scrolling performance, things like um, Spotify will affect the performance of Safari and Chrome, because it uses the same WebKit engine. So it affects the performance of the browser. So there are external factors on the machine that will always affect how the page renders, just as if I have an um, out-of-control process on my computer, my 
page will run slowly. But if you're trying to record timelines, be wary of closing other tabs or other instances of browsers or even other things that use um, the web views, for instance. So debugging comes down to state. Being able to understand exactly the state of your application at the point in which the bug occurred. Now, without state and without knowing what the state is, I'm having to guess what actually happened. Um, and I'm having to guess as to where the source of the bug is um, and what triggered it. And I've kind of broken it down. There are, the tools are based around two different um, ways of looking at state. You have um, passive state. And what I mean by that is um, what has happened to get us to this point in time. And that can range from um, looking at variable values, um, network request history, um, rendering histories, um, canvas rendering histories, uh, memory usage, and so on. But it's, it's looking back at um, what happened and using kind of a, a snapshot of, of that state to debug. And then you have interactive state. And this is, what, this is how I use my um, uh, dev tools. I'm able to actually interact with the state and change the state of the application in real time so that I can either force the, the software into getting, a point, getting into the point where it can uh, create the bug, or I can actually fix it in real time inside of the application um, and be sure that the code change I've made or the change to the state has fixed the problem. And this is what I love about my dev tools. Um, and I'm going to show you this later. Um, so importantly here as well, if I make a change to um, the state with dev tools, if I make that change, the whole application will back up a little bit. The, the point of execution it will back up, and it will be able to rerun the change I've just made, either to um, some variable value or some actual code. It will be recompiled in real time. So this is the information we'll use to uh, find where this bug is in the first place, the stack. And the stack is how did we arrive to this point, uh, this state. It'd be really useful, I think, it'd be really useful if I could take a complete snapshot of the entire browser's state at any time and say, I want to rerun that stack or that sequence of events to get back to that state. It doesn't exist yet. Um, I think uh, React Redux DevTools gets close to this kind of thing, uh, but there's nothing in pure JavaScript. And um, going back to my kind of um, uh, transpiled state, this is why I generally prefer to work with uh, un compiled JavaScript where possible, because this state really doesn't tell me much. On one side, I've got, um, I think it's called Redbox, has given me the stack trace. On the other side is the uh, browser stack trace. And again, there's, like, there's very little in there. There's just, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing that's useful to me as a human to actually debug that. So what I'm, uh, the, the, the stack will tell me how we got to that point and how we got to that, uh, that, that state. Then we have the tool, the t different types of tools we have at our disposal are um, tools that let us look from the inside out, like um, setting breakpoints. If we know where the actual bug occurs, we want to see what, f uh, what factors cause that bug. So that's, a, that's what I call an inside out bug, where you know where to break the code deep inside your application. You know that some function is getting the wrong variable, but you don't know what caused that state in the first place? What, what was the stack? What were the requests? What was the interaction? And then you have um, outside, outside in, which is more kind of observational. Um, and I'll show you those in a moment. So this is, uh, this is kind of inside out. So this is where you have a knowledge of the code in the first place, where you might be familiar with the code yourself. You know some problem exists in a particular uh, file. You're able to set a breakpoint either a, a debugger statement, so you can literally write the word debugger in the code, and the code will break. Um, you can set a breakpoint manually. You can do conditional breakpoints where some expression is true, then pause the code at this point in time. And from there, we have a whole load of information. So over in the screenshot, I've got um, a full stack. Um, I've got all the local variables. I've got all of the variables that are in scope. Um, I can actually see inline variables. So uh, you might be able to see up in the top corner, you can see URL equals 
you know, numbers dash go, so I can see in, in the actual code, there's information that tells me what's going on, what is the state of the application, and from there, I can make some changes. Outside in uh, ranges from things like um, setting breakpoints on DOM modification. So if I know something, something causes this, this part of the DOM to either re-render or change or add a class, I can set a breakpoint to say, when an attribute changes on this DOM node, break the code. I don't know what's causing it, but I can break the code, and it'll pause. And from the stack trace, I should be able to see you know, where is my code that was causing that thing. I can take screenshots, and I can use that to diagnose problems. And I'll show you that later on in the, um, uh, the live coding section. Um, so this is, the screenshots are right at the top. So I'll use this information to kind of uh, scrub back and forth. And where I see there's kind of a, like a rendering tick, I'll use that point in time to try and work out what JavaScript or what uh, network requests ran so I can then dig in and try and find the source of this problem. And then you have um, break on arbitrary events like um, uh, geolocation lookups, drag and drop, and so on and so forth. You can also do things like XHR replays. So you can replay an AJAX request. If you know that a particular AJAX request is causing a problem, you can keep running it until it's fixed either on the server side or fixed on the client side. Uh, network requests, and so on. So I'm now going to switch to my, um, my live demo <laughs> and show you some of my favorite debugging uh, techniques. This is also where I lose my clock, and uh, I switch to uh, mirroring. So hopefully, this will work. So right, just give us a second while we change. Um, so let's make this nice and big. I've got this application here. That's pretty big. Cool. So application, uh, it's, uh, it's not the, the best application in the world, um, but it, it loads GIFs, OK? Um, and I stop the GIFs from running too many times, otherwise it gets super distracting. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, let's choose a different one. Right, so um, I've opened up DevTools, and I want to make some changes. Uh, I'm not very. Uh, very keen on this, this white background. OK, so I'm going to set the background to uh, hot pink. Um, but if I, um, I can't save this at this point in time. And I really like to make my changes inside the browser um, and not switch back and forth through my code, you know, switch back to the browser, have to refresh, and so on. I don't even like refreshing, to be fair. Um, I just want to do all my coding here. So what I'm going to do is uh, just get rid of the uh, style there, um, take my browser, and I'm just going to drag in, oops drag in my uh, folder into DevTools. And from there, it's going to ask me if uh, it's allowed to access that directory. Um, so I'm going to allow that to happen. And down here in the sources, I still have my, my host, my origin, uh, uh, localhost port 8000. But I now have this directory. And this directory is the, the back end to this, uh, this code. Um, and I've got this prompt to use um, uh, workspace mapping. What I can do is I can select one of these files, maybe this uh, CSS file, and then right click, um, and I'm going to do map to uh, network resource. And from there, DevTools is going to try and make the best guess as to which file on my, uh, on my drive actually matches the um, resource that I served up. Now, in this case, I've only got one workspace, this loops gif plane. So it finds a, a file called style.css in this directory. I say, yeah, that's that one. Um, and what it's gone and done is it's mapped the entire directory structure from um, the local host all the way down to my uh, local file system. So now um, the CSS is mapped to my file system, but also so is the JavaScript. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but where I made this change to uh, the background color, um, I've got a little star here showing that it's uh, not saved. I'm just going to do Command S. And I can refresh a page if I want to, but it's still hot pink. OK? Um, I can also do that from the Elements panel. So let's go and over here. What do I do? Background? Oh, gosh, come on. There you go. So I can pick the color. Um, maybe hot pink is too pink. Maybe I want blue. Um, I don't know. That'll do. Uh, hit Enter. And that's saved. OK, so I don't need to hit Refresh. That's done. OK, and when I show this in my workshop, um, people tend to kind of freak out and say, uh, but how do I, how do I um, undo that change? Well, 
you're using source control. So that's, how, that's one of the ways you would undo the change. But DevTools has undo as well. So you know, let's, let's change this color to, I don't know, orange. Um, let's try and move see, these dominoes around a little bit as well. So I'm just going to put the, oh, I deleted the button. That was bad. Um, and I deleted one of the GIFs. And I'm going to make some changes here, like image uh, width equals 2,000 px. Um, I've made a bunch of changes, but whilst DevTools is open, I can just do Command Z. So I'm just doing Command Z or Control Z, and it's undoing all the changes. And you can see it's undoing all the CSS changes. Um, if I go over to the Elements panel, I can undo all the DOM node changes I made. And it's going all the way back to what I actually loaded it with, uh, what I, how I loaded the page in the first place. Now, if you use something like um, Sublime or VS Code or TextMate or whatever DevTools like, editor you use, you can keep undoing any changes you make until you close Sublime. And if you open it up again, you wouldn't expect to be able to undo some changes you made. Well, DevTools is exactly the same. Whilst this DevTools window is open, I can keep undoing as many changes as I want. But if I close it and reopen it, then I've lost all of my changes. OK, so I can undo changes I'm making here. If I'm kind of playing around with a color, I can undo all of these changes as I go along. OK, so um, like I said, one of my favorites is never leaving the, um, uh, the browser and not refreshing. But I can also do inline um, changes, changes in memory. And this is what I was talking about being able to debug the state, an interactive state. So when I click this Run button, I get um, two GIFs. And you know, two GIFs isn't enough. We always need more GIFs. So let's put a breakpoint in this code. This is where it's getting the, um, uh, the two GIFs from, this two here. So if I click Run, the code's going to break. And um, oh, I'm now stepping inside of this function. Um, and from here, if I want to, I can make a change to the code. And I can say, well, we want six, actually. Um, and the code's now moved to kind of an edit mode. I've got the star up here in the corner. Hit Command S. I'm saving the code. And the code is now back into kind of running. It's recompiled that function, as simple as it is. And it's backed up the execution. And if I hit Play, I get six GIFs. OK? So run it again. I still got six GIFs. And that's saved the disk. So if I actually load that page up again entirely, like I do a full, uh, full refresh, I will still have six GIFs. I can also completely change this function. So you know, maybe um, arrow functions aren't that readable to you. I can just change it like this, hit Save, uh, click on Run. Let's go back to two or four even. I got four GIFs. It's just recompiled that code in memory. And I can do all my debugging directly in memory here. Um, and I can also undo all of that. So I'm back at 6. So um, whilst I'm in the console, um, I just want to show you a few things that I like here as well. Um, one of my favorite, well, I, I come from a Perl background. So because I come from a Perl background, there's a, I've got a favorite variable in the console. Um, it's probably not something to brag about. Uh, anyway. so. If you run an expression in the console, um, you know, I've run some arbitrary math, it gives me a number. Um, there is this, this global console variable called dollar underscore. Okay? And dollar underscore is the value of the last expression. So in this case, the value of the last expression is 13, so the value of dollar underscore is 13. But I can use this for promises as well. So I can do, um, if I do something like new promise, um, resolve, uh, Set timeout, uh, resolve in like 1,000 milliseconds. What are we going to do? No. Uh, I'm going to resolve with some value. I don't know. Hi. Um, in this case, I ran some code, but I forgot to capture it in a variable. I was just testing out some code, and I forgot to actually capture the variable, uh, capture my promise in a variable. Um, and I can get it back by doing dollar underscore. And from dollar underscore, I can do dot then uh, v, and then I can do uh, console dot log v. And it should print out the high, the thing, the resolved promise. Um, so I can use dollar underscore to kind of 
get back variables, but I can also use it to kind of constantly chain. I can, I can have a look at what was chained out of that uh, function call. Um, and in this case, it should be undefined, because console log returns undefined. So I really like the dollar underscore value uh, variable. Um, and there are other dollar variables inside of uh, DevTools. So um, one that's really useful is dollar zero. Dollar zero represents um, the current selected DOM node. So you can see it over here when I, when I actually click on a DOM node, it says dollar zero. As I'm clicking around, um, it's also capturing a history of all the variables, uh, all the DOM nodes I've clicked on. So um, let's go to, oh yeah, go to the body. And in the console, I can do dollar zero uh, tag name. And I I've, I've currently have the body tag selected. Um, so I can do things with this dot uh, inner HTML. OK, so I have an HTML there. Um, I can do dollar underscore, uh, I don't know, reverse. That's probably not going to work, but you get the idea. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, oh, because I needed that. Um, yeah, there we go. So I just made some garbage on the page. Um, but this is really useful for doing kind of DOM manipulation on the command line. So if I want to get rid of that, that um, H1, this thing here, I can do $0.remove, and it'll get rid of it for me. Um, this is a nice quick way of navigating around, using the console to navigate the DOM. I also have $1, which is a previous selected element, $2, which is one before that, $3, and so on and so forth. As I click through, that stack changes. Um, and again, one of my favorite uh, command line tools is copy. So I'm extremely guilty of um, doing something like an XHR request and then going into the network panel and kind of selecting the response and clicking and dragging it all and trying to copy it and then I kind of copy it back into Sublime and have to tidy it up and so on and so forth. Or in here, when I've got, um, I don't know, document.body.innerHTML, uh, I would copy this and then kind of try and tidy it up. Well, you can just do copy, oops, copy, dollar uh, underscore, OK? And that will copy the last expression, which was uh, some HTML. So let's show you that. Nope, undefined. Oh, because I did console log. There you go. Uh, copy, dollar underscore. There you go. So that's the HTML copied. Um, the reason why it was undefined last time is because I did console clear. Uh, but wavy hands, you didn't see that. Um, where I have dollar zero pointing at a DOM node, I can copy DOM nodes. OK, so I can copy dollar zero, and that will copy the HTML of the dollar uh, zero. So I can actually copy DOM nodes and not have to worry about kind of dollar in their HTML. Um, I can copy objects. And that will give me uh, JSON. So that is actually formatted as JSON, so I can go ahead and use that elsewhere. Um, and in network requests, I don't think I have any XHR in here, but uh, let's have a look. JSON. I don't think I have any JSON in here, but I can actually copy um, curl requests. Oh, you can't see that very well. But I can copy all kinds of things here. So I can copy the response of a, a network request, particularly XHR requests. I can actually copy the responses, um, and I can copy as curl. And this is really useful as well. Um, so I know that uh, Harry, at the, in the, at the first talk on the stage, he actually showed it a little bit as well. But you can do things like uh, throttling, throttling requests, and kind of emulating a poor network. So. Um, Having a look at this, I can go over to the network uh, panel. And over here, I've got the different types of um, uh, presets. So I can emulate an offline connection if I'm doing anything with service workers or app cache. Um, I can also get an idea of what the page feels like if I was requesting under GPRS. Um, now, this does not replace real mobile testing, but at least it gives you a preview as to what that will be like. Um, if I want to see what my blog feels like at uh, uh, 2G, then I can use this. Um, and in addition to this, I can, uh, if I go in, oh, not offline, I can also throttle the CPU performance um, and emulate slowing down the connection. And again, this does not replace taking a real mobile device and testing it, but it's useful for getting a visual uh, uh, idea as to 
what, uh, what might be causing your page to slow down its kind of first paint, for instance. So um, on that note, I've used this to debug uh, JS bin. So I'm not going to re-record this. I, I recorded a timeline earlier on just so that I could have uh, the timeline captured properly. Um, this is uh, JS bin, my tool that I wrote. There you go, it looks like that. Um, and I slowed down the network so I could kind of force the page to kind of feel slower so I could almost load the page in slow motion. That was the aim of doing this. Um, and in that slow motion, what I have here is I've turned on the screenshots during the performance panel, not the network request, but the performance panel. And as the page is loading, I have a screenshot. And this is what I was talking about with like an outside in. I know there is a flash on the page, but I don't know what's causing it. And this has just been loading and loading and loading. Then it goes blank. And then at this point, the code loads. And then I notice that all the code vanishes for a period of time, and then it comes back in again. OK, and I could see this happening when I was visiting JSBin myself, but I, I wasn't sure what was happening because it was, it was quite quick, but I could notice this slowdown, this, uh, this flash. So I went into DevTools, um, slowed down the network request, and then took these screenshots and highlighted the section where uh, it does this flashing process and had a look at what was going on, what code was running, what network requests were happening, and when I dug in, I found that actually this is the big problem. The font was loading at this point, and then it was trying to render the font onto the screen. So just before the font came in, I could see the code. As the font started coming down, the code vanishes. So I then went on to use that information to change the way the font was loaded entirely to completely get rid of that, that brief flashing period. So that's how I've used screenshots. And screenshots are in two different places. You have it in the network panel over here. Um, and in the performance panel where you actually have to check it and enable it. So I just want to show you one last uh, thing. So this is a, a game I wrote. Um, it's not a great game, but it's a game nonetheless. You click around, click on boxes, and so on and so forth. Um, and it has a memory leak in it. Now, I didn't write it to have a memory leak, um, but I found that it had a memory leak. So. Um, when you're, uh, this is a pretty straightforward, repeatable approach to finding memory links. So I would take my web page, and I would take a baseline uh, snapshot of memory leaks. So this is under memory. I'm going to hit refresh, and I'm going to take a snapshot of the application in its kind of idle state. And then I'm going to go back to my application and create a, a, um, create a systematic, uh, repeatable process. And that, Processes, I'm going to create a new game three times. So I'm going to click new game, new game, new game. And I go back to my memory leaks, uh, my, my profiles rather, and I'm going to take another snapshot. And from there, I can compare these two snapshots. So between the first and second snapshot, the state has changed. But I don't know to what degree, like a whole bunch of things happened. Like the, the timer bar went down, the game was loaded three times, the arrangement of boxes changed. Um, but I can compare this to the previous snapshot. And from this, I have uh, all the changes. And I'm, with a memory leak, the thing I'm most, inter most interested in is the deltas, the, the difference between the first snapshot and the second snapshot. Now, um, there's a really good 15-minute uh, talk on how memory works in uh, Chrome. I'll try and post that link on Twitter. Um, uh, but for the moment, trust that I, uh, when I say that anything in brackets, you can basically ignore. That's what I got from this video. So I'm looking down this list of things, um, and I'm ignoring anything in brackets, because that means it's, it's part of Chrome. It's something I don't ha really have control of. Um, but what I am looking at here is um, I've got this detached DOM tree and um, these HTML div elements. And I've got 147 left over. Now, 147. There's seven squares. Uh, the, the grid is actually seven by seven. Uh, seven by seven? Seven times seven. There we go. Um, there's actually a seven by seven grid on the uh, game. And I actually clicked the refresh three times. And that seven times seven times three gives me 147, which is this number here. So there's a correlation between the deltas of um, or HTML div elements left over and the game I'm playing. And when I dig into this, I can see this list of elements. 
And what I've got here are uh, two different color, uh, color schemes. So the first one, yellow, means that there is a live um, JavaScript reference to a DOM node. Now, that may be because JavaScript is still referring to that DOM node in the game. The red one, on the other hand, this means that the, um, the garbage collection has tried to clean this DOM node up and failed to do so because there is um, like a leaky reference back to this DOM node. And this is the kind of thing that will be a memory leak. Basically, DOM nodes that you have references to that your code can't really reach and can't be cleaned up. And when I dig into this, um, I don't get my answer. It isn't presented to me kind of um, you know, perfectly, but it gives me clues as to where the problem will be. And when I did dig into this, because this, this is a real bug, um, I was able to see uh, this kind of this responder thing. Oops. Um, I could dig into this code a bit more. Um, and I eventually worked out that it was to do with the library I was using. Um, and there was the way that I was cleaning up wasn't getting rid of these DOM nodes properly when I was clicking on new. I was doing kind of an inner HTML, blast away the uh, context, but I had a click handle left over, uh, which was causing this memory leak. Um, but there's also one other uh, way of memory profiling. You can do real-time allocation. So it's a little bit more kind of um, a fuzzy approach, but you can record, you can make changes. Uh, I highly recommend being systematic about your changes, um, but it will show you kind of what's going on in memory. If I stop, you should be able to see, um, you know, dig into here, what was allocated, was it cleaned up? You can do forced garbage collection and so on. But these are all clues into debugging. Um, and there is no silver bullet. There are lots and lots of tools at your disposal. I focus most, uh, I'm focusing entirely on Chrome, but there are also um, unique debugging tools in um, uh, Firefox. There are some unique, tool, uh, some unique aspects in um, Microsoft Edge and using uh, VS Code and putting those two things together. Um, but there are lots of ways to debug. Hopefully, some of these have been useful. Um, and I am finished. So thank you. <laughs>